Um, hello, uh, I'm Fiona Rogers. I am the VNA Parasol Foundation Curator of Women in Photography. Um, I'm also the uh, L X Parry Photo Curator this year. Um, you'll discover the pathway. Um, 38 different artists all responding to this idea of the lived experience. So very personal work, amazing uh, self-portraiture, uh, documentary style, a lot of performance-based work. Um, so please go and discover that. Um, and then today we've got this amazing talks program. Um, so at five o'clock, we're gonna be celebrating the new LX Parry Photo Anniversary book um, with Kearing Women in Motion and the Ministry of Culture. And then at 6.30, we have an amazing uh, keynote um, that is chaired by uh, Mark Seeley from Autograph um, with the incredible Dr. Deb Willis. So I hope that you will be able to join us for that. But I'm here with three incredible artists. We're here um, to talk about acts of resistance, new approaches to covering conflict. Um, this is something I'm interested in uh, as a curatorial program at the Victoria and Albert Museum. We're particularly interested in quite political subject matter. We've done a lot around Iran and women life freedom, working a lot with Hodder over the last year. Um, we acquired Hodder's work last year for the museum. We just heard from a couple of other amazing artists, Tara Krynak uh, as a Peruvian American artist whose work we also acquired last year. So the curatorial program that we have is, is really um, looking at, you know, I think we can't have a curatorial program at the museum without uh, addressing some of the most fundamental issues for women um, at the moment. Last year, we brought uh, Laya Abril's On Rape exhibition to London, and next year we will host um, a co-host, a co-curated exhibition with South London Gallery, um, which is an uh, initiative that myself and Sarah Allen, which I can see her little face in the audience, whoop, um, we're putting together a new exhibition that looks at contemporary feminist activist lens-based practice since 2010. So if you happen to be in London, I hope you'll join us for that. So I'm gonna introduce very, very quickly, all of the bios are on the website, so I'm not gonna bore you with endless bits of CV uh, information, but I'm really happy to be um, joined today by Yelena, Yelena Yemchuk, is an Ukrainian um, artist who is uh, now living in New York City. Uh, Hoda Afshar is an Iranian um, artist that is now living in Melbourne, and Miriam Balus, who is a Lebanese artist living in Beirut. Um, and they've all got these absolutely fantastic uh, new-ish books out. So Miriam is doing a book signing um, with Aperture today at five, and Yelena is doing one with Gost at Kominak. At oh, sorry, this is not... Oh. Kominak, Kominak stand, yeah. Kominak stand where she's uh, exhibiting in the Curiosa section. Hoda Afshar is also exhibiting in the Curiosa section and she has this incredible um, major retrospective exhibition on at the moment at the New Art Gallery of New South Wales called um, A Curve is a Broken Line. Um, so I'm gonna hand over to Miriam. Hi. <clears throat> Uh, is it working? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'm Miriam Boulos. I'm a, photo I'm a Lebanese photographer. Um, I'm going to try to be quick. Uh, so, like, my relationship with photography started a very long time ago. When I was five, I had this tiny little Fushia camera and that I loved and one day I was in the car with my family and my younger brother threw the camera away from the window and I still remember like until now this moment very clearly it felt you know when you're washing your hands with the soap and the soap slides away from your hand it felt exactly as if reality was ex escaping from from me and about 10 years later I met a girl who became one of my closest friends and she had this sophisticated camera and I fell in love with photography and I told my mom, I want the same camera and she was like, of course not. And she told me you have to develop your gaze before having this expensive object. And from this moment, photography became the most fluid thing in my life and the most easier, easiest thing in my life. 
and photography became a um, way of grasping reality. So, yeah. Um, I'm going to try to multitask and talk while showing the slideshow. So, during my first years as a photographer, I only took pictures in black and white and at night. I feel like the nightlife is very similar to revolutions. It's a way of collectively like exteriorizing everything that we were taught to bottle up and silence and keep in us. And um, I took pictures in like in spaces of intimacy, but also in spaces of like in public spaces. Um, it's for me, I think that it's the, it's places in which we are both exposed to violence and emotional, like emotional and physical violence. Um, and it's something that I always try to do in my images. I try to put a light on things that are normalized and oppressed when they shouldn't be. And you're going to see, I mean, you're seeing that I always use a direct flash. For me, it's a way from one side to, again, put a light on things that are normalized, like in a very literal way. And from another side, it's a way of kind of, again, getting closer to reality. It's a way of touching reality and like grasping reality. Um, and for me, photography is a kind of a sensory seeking thing. Um, it's a way of getting closer to senses. Yeah. And as you can see in these images, I didn't use to include text. I used, like, my practice was only image based. And in 2019, the revolution started in Lebanon. And for me, it felt like collectively coming out of an abusive relationship. And from one day to the other, I'm trying to. Next slide, please. Yes, OK, thank you, wherever you are. <laughs> um, OK. <laughs> so from, from one day to the other, I started to take pictures in colors, too, and during the day. Uh, this phase was so important to me. It, I think it changed me completely. It changed my approach. It changed my way of seeing things. Um, and I became very aware of the fact that by telling my own personal experience, I was inevitably telling a collective story and the story of like so many people who were living the sim a similar thing in Lebanon. And this is when I became very interested in including text in my work. Um, this is the cover of the book. So I became very interested in including text in my work in order to being able to also listen to people and to kind of, this is going to sound basic, but to kind of amplify the, the voices of other people through my own visual language. And uh, I also started shamelessly taking a lot of space with my diary, because for me, it's very important to, to question how we document our region, I mean, my region. And it's important not to reduce us to numbers and statistics, but to show much more personal stories in order to let, I mean, to hope that people will relate and humanize us. Yes. Actually, there are, there are still a lot of images, I think. But uh, I don't want to take more time. I think, I think we're done, like 10 minutes. Yeah. Thank you. I'm just going to let the images slide very quickly. Well, maybe, maybe whilst you flick through those, maybe we could just say a little bit about the book. Because actually one of the questions that I actually I have for all of you, but maybe Miriam, you could start, is, is this kind of role of dissemination, particularly the role of dissemination, particularly when you're talking about, you know, very political subject matter. And the importance for you, you know, all of you, actually, but what speaks specifically about Miriam's um, new book with Aperture, um, about this role of 
a bookmaking and whether or not you feel like books are, uh, you know, the uh, books the best vehicle, the the worst vehicle, and like what for you? Um, how do you feel about seeing, you know, this work in in a book format? Is does, does that feel satisfying for you, or do you like work to exist in, you know, I don't know, social media or other other areas? I have so many answers to this question, actually, because from one side. Um, for me, it's very important that my work is shown in different ways and different spaces. It, like, I really believe in the democratiza democratization of images. I, I like, like, I think it's important that my images are on social media, uh, in in exhibitions, in yeah. um, also in publications. Um, yeah, we can also, um, but also for me, I mean, a book is one of the mediums that are important to show this. And I think that this is the proof, like this conversation right now, like I'm talking to people I wouldn't have spoken to in another way through this book and this conversation. Um, and also, but I, I am very aware of the fact that a book is a very elite like it, it touches an elite uh, audience, which is also important. And I have to say that it is absurd to, it is absurd and important at the same time to, to launch my book in this current situation. But I think that it's a way of resisting, like it's true images and it's a way of fighting and reclaiming what's ours, which is exactly what my book is about, through images and through our own language of storytelling and documentary. And I just also wanted to talk very quickly about a slightly different body of work, but um, this idea that you were inviting people to kind of, well, why don't you tell us about this body of work? Yeah, of course. If you want to. So, or I can do that if you want. Thank you. If you want. Collaboration, you see? Yes, look, look exactly. at that. <laughs> exactly. So exactly a month after the explosion, the Beirut port explosion, um, I was still documenting in a very intense way. Yes, <laughs> I was still <laughs> I was still in documenting in a very intense way, and um, I felt the need to focus on something that was present in me, independently from, like, and something that was not directly imposed by the situation. And I've been interested in sexual fantasies for a few, year na a few years now since I discovered my own, actually. And I've been wanting to explore sexual fantasies in my work through images. And I very impulsively, like as an act of resistance and survival during this whole absurd phase after, like post-explosion, I just posted um, an open call on Instagram saying, if you are a woman or if you have been socialized as a woman and you want to share your sexual fantasies, send me an email. And it's a very collaborative approach and work. So every time I receive an email, I ask each person to, to tell me if they want to create an image with me and how they imagine the image and if they want to be present in the picture or not and what they want to show or hide and where they want to be photographed, etc. And for me, it's, it's very much aligned with, with everything I do in photography, like from the nightlife to the revolution, through sexual fantasies. It's just different contexts to explore sociopolitical, yes, <laughs> sociopolitical issues that are oppressed and normalized and like taking space through images with all of these things, like, like transforming oppression into resistance. I think this image says everything about this. <laughs> Yeah. And, and how, what's the response been since you've made this work? I mean, how, where have you been able to show it? Where, maybe where have you not been able to show it? How's that kind of affected how the work travels? So I have to say that it's a work in progress. So I've been working on it for almost three years and I still feel like it's still the very beginning of it. But I've, I exhibited it in... Um, Tunis, in Berlin, um, and in many publications, like 
many publications, but um, I still feel like I'm looking for something. I didn't find what I'm looking for yet, because when I work on a project, it's always like I start with an idea and then the images like teach me a lot of things and I'm not there yet. Yeah. And, and the women that you were working with, um, I loved what you said actually about, you repeat that? Have you been aw awakened sexually as a woman? Or what did you say earlier? I thought that was beautiful. Um, you mean since I discovered my own sexual fantasies? And then you said yeah. something about, um, you put an open call out to women and um, women that the have... open call, you mean? Yeah, yeah it's uh, if you are a woman or you have been socialized as a woman and you want to show yeah, your sexual fantasies, right. yeah. it's actually very basic, mm. but it's something that is like that exists in all of us and we just don't talk about it. Yeah, we just keep it like, yeah, yeah. And how did, the, how did they feel about being a part of the project? Was it a sort of liberating, uh, empowering uh, I, experience? I think it's always liberating for both of us and I think that it's not only a binary relationship it's all it's also like I think that the viewer is part of the experience and for me at at last at least it's uh it's liberating yeah I yeah thank you thank you thank you Roger, take it away Is it working? Yeah, it is. Um, hello, everybody. Thanks, Miriam. Um, my name is Hoda Afshar, and I'm an Iranian-born uh, photographer, and I'm based in Melbourne, Australia. I'm going to talk about um, the female-led revolutionary uprisings in Iran um, in 2022 and 23. But before getting into, into that, I just wanted to acknowledge that there's a much more pressing issue at the moment um, that is occupying the heart and mind of many of us, the war in Gaza. And I just wanted to acknowledge that and um, express my solidarity with the people in Palestine. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I want to talk about two different projects that I made in response to the uprisings in Iran last year. And um, as many of you know, um, after the killing of Mahsa Jina Amini in Iran in September 22, um, a series of uprisings started across the country and also outside um, in response to the event. Um, she was murdered at the hands of the morality police in Iran. and. Um, it started off a protest that for the first time was leading into something that many called the first female-led revolution um, in the world. And so um, I remember at the beginning of the uprisings, um, uh, Verena Kasper from um, MQ Museum in Vienna contacted me and said, we have these billboards outside of the museum that we often commission artists to make work about. Um, um, to make work for, and I thought if you want to use it as a platform for what's going on in Iran at the moment. So at that point, you know, it, we were all uh, paralyzed by, you know, uh, what we were seeing online on social media, and we were flooded by the images of uprisings and rallies across the country, which was creating a lot of hope for us, but at the same time, a very brutal reaction from the Iranian government to, to the uprisings, and which led to the killing of another five, 600 uh, people, young people, and uh, the arrest of thousands and thousands of people who are still in prison to this day. So I felt at that point that there's nothing I can make or do that would um, basically be more important than sharing the images of the photographers who were making work anonymously in the country and sharing it on social media. So I wanted to use that platform for that reason. And um, in fact, it's just like curating um, um, a series of images to show in public spaces. As a photographer who um, I've, I've been always, you know, very much engaged with the documentary genre. And my, for those of you who don't know my work, I 
uh, work with documentary subjects and it's often real people in real spaces performing their stories for, for the camera and for the audience. So I kind of use that technique as a form of collaboration with the subjects. My subjects are often people who um, and communities or places that um, somehow are misrepresented or underrepresented or not represented at all, like um, people whose voices have been made um, inaudible and their images um, invisible. So uh, for me, photography became a way of, um, you know, responding to different forms of violence. And in this context, for the first time, I was seeing that the women on the streets of Iran were basically using the strategy that I used for the last 15 years to challenge the genre of documentary. And it was basically, they were doing the same thing. They were performing their rebelliousness and their, um, you know, revolution for the gaze of the audience outside. It was quite incredible to see, um, you know, um, um, like uh, the, the repetition, like people were using this um, um, kind of act of repetition as a form of protest. The same act was done by different people across different, um, you know, corners of the country, but it was a way of signaling to one another that I'm in it too. So like in this context, people were setting bins on fire on the streets and where standing on the bins, women like this kind of symbolic act of holding their scarves or burning their scarves, holding their fist in the sky and getting someone to take their picture and sharing it on social media. Some of these images were sent to me by some photographer friends in Iran during the uprisings and they were asking me to share them around and using our platforms to raise their voices. So I kind of um, um, tried to do that at that point by occupying public spaces with the images that were made by those anonymous actors and photographers. It was um, so later on, so many people, including Emma Barkett, um, approached me and asked me to share these images in different exhibition contexts. They traveled to Brazil all around, you know, like in many, many places. And I was very happy to see. What I want to share with you is the images that I'm currently showing with my gallery, Milani Gallery, here in this um, uh, fair. And it's a series of works that I made. The title is Intern for, um, for my current uh, survey exhibition, was commissioned by the Art Gallery of New South Wales. And I wanted to use that platform again to respond to the events in Iran. One of these um, acts of you know, rebelliousness that I was talking about, like the previous images that I showed you, something that was being repeated again was this act of plaiting each other's hair on the streets and making pictures of it and set, sharing it on social media. But what is not really known much to the audience is that both the um, uh, slogan of woman life freedom and this act of plaiting hair comes from the Kurdish female fighters, the uh, liberation movement of Kurdish women in Kurdistan and um, in this context, Rojava, which uh, women, um, um, you know, it has decades long history and uh, Kurdish women plait each other's hair in the morning before going to fight against ISIS. And they sing in the mountains, Zhen Jian Azadi, and they have been developing some of the most progressive idea, ideas around, you know, new feminist movements, and which is very critical of Western movement and sees it as a capitalist version of feminism. So Kurdish women started this movement and somehow it found its way into the streets of Iran. And we were seeing again like women making risks and um, basically uh, taking their headscarves off and plaiting each other's hair on the streets of Iran and getting someone to photograph it and sharing it on social media and resharing and resharing it. So this act of, you know, rep repetitiveness, again, repetition became a mode of, you know, defiance and remembrance and, um, um, again, signaling to each other that, um, you know, I'm here, I'm part of it, and also that the revolution is alive. Um, another symbol of the uh, movement was the, um, the dove, and I don't know if I could play this video here. No, I don't think it's working. But um, for the families of those whose children were murdered um, at the hands of the government, at the funerals, they started releasing white doves in the sky. 
And that became again another symbol and something that was speaking to the grieving um, as much as we were talking to the hope. So across the country, but, but also in the rallies that us, the diaspora Iranians, were holding outside of Iran, we started using the same symbol at the rallies we were releasing doves. So I wanted to take those two symbols because if I want to describe the experience of um, all of us, a shared grief, a collective grief um, for Iranians inside and outside was, again, this juxt juxtaposing feeling of hope, or hopefulness and, um, you know, um, um, and mournfulness at the same time, which was quite jarring, I have to say. So I used both Dove um, and the, the hair um, as the, those two symbols for, the, for, the, for this project. So I worked with a group of Iranian women that um, are quite close to me and during the six months of rallying on the streets of Melbourne, every week we were just basically organizing protests to uh, be the voice of our people outside. And so I asked those of them who had very long hair, as you can see, um, to participate in this project. And um, we made these photographs together. I, I shot these photos on large format cameras, like a, a large format camera, because I wanted to contrast that aesthetic of the, um, of the internet and also, you know, the slowness of the a large format camera, analog camera, um, was helping me to capture this notion of time, you know, something that like the movement and also, um, again, the contrast between the stillness and the movement. And um, yeah, again, as you can see, very repetitive, um, repetition as an act of protest, as a strategy of it. And, um, yeah, for me, these images are speaking to to the idea of connecting and sisterhood. And um, the, the use of a sky as a backdrop was also, uh, for me, a way of um, uh, um, removing them from, from geography. You know, like uh, I didn't want to place them in a um, specific context uh, because, you know, sisterhood is something that we all share um, ac across different cultures. And the hair and plaiting hair has a very long history of... Um, you know, um, uh, in, the, in the women's liberation movement across, you know, the black women in America to uh, Kurdish women to Asia Pacific and so, and, and um, to Iran. So um, this is an image of the work that is installed at the Art Gallery of New South Wales and a small collection of it is currently on display here that you can see. Thank you. Thank you, Hoda. Um, I also wonder if you were if you were referencing this idea about um, women's hair in art history as well, and this idea about you know the history of hair and the representation of hair and women kind of at their toilette. Is that something that you were kind of interested in while you were when you were making the the work? I did look at it. Um, I did look at it a lot, and um, that's why I, I, when when you realize, you know, how much our struggles are connected, um, you know, uh, it goes beyond borders. It goes beyond, you know, the boundaries of culture. And yeah, I definitely wanted to uh, reference that as a kind of a universal theme. Yeah, and obviously referencing the, because they're not veiled. This act of you know resistance against. You know, the, the burning of the, the repetition, I guess, of the burning of the hijab as well, something that we were seeing a lot of those images coming out of Iran over the last year. Yeah, absolutely. But I also want to acknowledge here that the, the, the um, protests and the revolution was not about, you know, um, the, the, there were a lot of confusion at the time whether this is Islamophobic or not. In fact, many women in hijab were fighting alongside of the women on the streets of Iran because it was about the uh, right to choose. You know, the Islamic government of Iran has made it mandatory for women to wear hijab and it was about, you know, bodily autonomy. So um, um, we, there, there are some images which are quite moving uh, from, from that period that women in hijab are plaiting another woman's hair uh, without the hijab who's removing the headscarf. Yeah. Beautiful, thank you. Um, Thanks. Yelena. Hello.
Hello, um, my name is Yelena Yamchuk and I'm a Ukrainian um, artist. Um, uh, my parents um, immigrated when I was 11 to um, America and um, I had an, an amazingly beautiful childhood in Ukraine and um, when we left it was the Soviet Union. And I think the, the trauma of being kind of torn away from my homeland at such a fragile age of 11 and being taken to um, kind of a weird Wizard of Oz, Disneyland kind of a situation to America and <clears throat> from a very quiet, um, uh, family-filled, loving environment and knowing that we'll, I would never um, be able to see my family again at that point. Because if you left the Soviet Union in, in the 80s or the 70s or any time before Perestroika, is, you were never allowed to go back. So um, I'm going to start with these early photographs um, that I took in the 90s when I was able to go back to Ukraine. Um, after Ukraine became independent in 1991 and I was able to go back and see my grandmother and my family and I was just starting to find my uh, photographic language. I just, I was in school studying photography and I think these early trips to Ukraine really um, kind of identified me as an artist and kind of this missing childhood, this missing, um, this hole that I kind of had in me growing up was slowly being healed by me being able to document. Um, it's a very turbulent time um, also in a country that was kind of becoming independent um, and it was very corrupt and very um, turbulent time in the 90s. So these are the early photographs I took um, during that time um, in Ukraine um, that kind of um, filled me with a lot of uh, joy and a lot of, um, a lot of madness, too, <laughs> I guess. So, um, I'll go through these first. Um, is this the park? Is this Gerudo Park? No, this is oh. pre Gidro Park. Um, so these images I took in the late, like mid to late 90s to early um, 2000s, um, mostly in Kiev and a few from my first trip to um, Odessa. Um, I, I think I was very connected to the children because it was kind of like the, the time that I missed and the, the, the kind of their energy and their beautiful kind of, kind of going back to this um, connect, connecting to, to my childhood. I think that was like the, the, the first images I took there. Gidra Park um, was a book that I, um, was my first long-term project um, that I started in 2005 and I shot from 2005 to 2008 in Kiev in a, um, in a Soviet-built park for, uh, for the, the leisure, as they called it. Um, I was going back to see my grandmother on a regular basis and she was getting very old and losing her sight and and kept talking about her childhood. And she kept talking about the Dnieper River and her being young and swimming with her horses in the water. And she kept talking about the Dnieper, the Dnieper. And I went to Gidra Park with some friends. I forgot that it even existed because I used to go there as a kid. And um, I went with my friend, my English photographer friend, and I started shooting there. Um, this first trip and he said you have to stay here you have to this is your this is this is your project and this was for my grandma it was just I, I what I loved about 
the place and taking and being there every day with the local, like the people that were coming there every day, the people that came there on the weekends. And it just kind of, there was no time. It, it, it might as well have been when I was a kid, like this modern, uh, um, this kind of westernization of, um, of, of Ukraine at that point was still kind of, um, everyone kind of wanted to look English or American and, and they didn't, they didn't have their own style yet, which is so amazing right now in Ukraine where everyone has their own, their own thing. And this was like in the growing stages. And I kind of liked the idea of having them be undressed in a sense and, and having the time be non-existent because these pictures could have been taken in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. It didn't, to me, it was very much about the people and, and connecting to the people in my, in my hometown. And um, so, yeah, there's definitely uh, no time in these images. <laughs> they're really timeless like yeah. you say i mean there's a certain almost like a naivety to the you know sort of innocence they will there's like this picture is just it like i remember like being in the park and seeing this lady with her grandchild and it was just it was just like it was when i was little and i think it's just it's been very healing for me because i i just feel like all through I just never, I never felt like I fit in, and I've always felt like I was missing something, and that 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 pull to go back to Ukraine to document the urgency has been always so poignant to me and so important, and and I think now when we look at these images, I understand that I was, it's like almost like a subconscious instinct that Ukraine wasn't photographed very much during that period. Um, I mean, there obviously, but there wasn't like a bunch of foreigners going to photograph. Um, I think there was a handful of people there that were documenting. And to me, it was very important to capture this time and this country that was changing, that was going through a lot of, um, you know, uh, these pictures were taken after the Orange Revolution after there was so much turmoil and, and it was, a, a, it was a, a, a moment of freedom, a moment of like the people saying, you know, we're not going to be, you know, run by this corrupt government. And we're, it was just a joyful kind of a moment in history. I mean, as, as, as joyful it could be because it, the corruption was just never ending over there. Um, but um, I just love the characters and, and I love this, almost the surrealism of, Ukrainians in general and their sense of humor and their ability to survive, constantly survive and, and, and um, with a joke and a smile somehow through all of um, the turmoil that was happening there. Um, Odessa um, is a project that I started in um, 2015 after the uh, Russia invaded and exed, in exed Crimea. Um, I um, went to Odessa for the first, I went to Odessa for the second time and two years before that and um, fell in love, like fell in love, madly fell in love with the place, like with the boyfriend almost. And um, had um, just this romanticized idea of the city. And I think it was so different than photographing in Kiev, which brought me so much pain and history. And this was like a brand new place that I found so colorful and so um, full of life. And I really was like, I'm going back next year and I'm going to start a project there. And next in the, in the year after is, um, in 2014 was the, the, you know, basically the beginnings of the war that we are experiencing now. Um, so I spoke to a journalist friend of mine there and I said, listen, I want to come to Odessa and I want, I, I hear that there's all these young, um, people joining the military and I said, can you get me access to, um, to photograph them? And, and, and for me, it was very important to photograph the youth, um, 
in, in Odessa um, during that time. So when I photographed um, the, the, the kids at the military academy, I quickly understood that I needed to give them more context and I needed to photograph the city and everything about the city and um, everything that made me excited about this very um, incredible, magical uh, place that I have never been anywhere else like it. And um, so I spent um, five years um, going there for, for once a year at first and then three times um, um, a year and um, just meeting people, um, asking them to take their picture, going to every kind of possible event that was happening there. And um, I couldn't wait to get back there every time. And, um, and when I finished the book and we went to, um, we, were, we had plans to go to print um, um, in, in March. Uh, the war began in, uh, the, in February and uh, I had a very um, hard time figuring out if I wanna put this work out at all um, because I just felt like I've just spent like, you know, these five, six years documenting a place that is no longer <laughs> the place, you know, and now they're in a war. I mean, uh, the, the first months of just not being able to uh, even speak, uh, I think uh, the idea of even talking about art or documentation or any kind of form of expression seemed so frivolous to me. Um, and I reached out to some of my friends that are in the book and some friends that are not in the book. And they said, Elena, this is absolute time to sh have this work come out because people need to see what we're fighting for. People need to see our life before this invasion and how beautiful and loving and amazing we are. <laughs> so, um, so, I, so yeah, the book, um, came out um, last year and I, there's um, so many of my friends that, um, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Elena, Elena really. You did great. I mean, all your work is a real testament to what is happening in the world. And I thank you for making it. I thank you for sharing it. I thank you for being here. It is not an easy time. And I appreciate that we're in this slightly strange environment. And um, yeah, I just, I wanna thank you. I wanna thank you all for being here because we don't share these stories and there's just, there's really no point. Um, so we'll move very quickly on <laughs> before. So I, I wanted to ask you about, um, you know, the history of photography, history of photojournalism, documentary practice. I wanted to ask you all how you kind of feel about those kinds of practices, documentary and, and particularly sort of social documentary and photojournalism specifically, and your relationship to that kind of a medium and how, whether you think that's been successful in covering conflict, how you feel about those sorts of approaches um, and how, you, how it relates to your own work. Perhaps, Miriam, you wanna kick off? I think I'm taking the time to think about the, the, the question and answer. Um, but for me, it's, uh, it's kind of tricky because from one side there is the urgency and from another side, there is the, the need of not only reacting, but also reflecting in order to not to be like victim of any propaganda or anything. Um, and I think that the current context is very, like it's a good example because we're all trying to document in our own way. And for example, um, it's, it, I think that I think that this um, that documentary is uh, an ongoing like for me in particular for me 
at least it i'm it's always um like i'm constantly questioning this medium and how to document um because for example today for if we want to document the genocide that is happening in Palestine, uh, from one side, we need the mainstream Western medias that are biased and that are silencing us, but somehow people we are trying to communicate with only listen to them. So we need to, to infiltrate these platforms and these publications. So, and from another side, it's, like it's very contradictory and I think that it's very delicate too. So it's always an ongoing question in my, in my mind. Um, like even after the, the Beirut port explosion, I, I impulsively documented everything. Like the next day I was in the streets and documenting with many publications, but um, two years later, I'm, asking my, I'm still asking myself that I do this correctly. Did I miss something actually because I, reacted in a very impulsive way? Did I miss something in the narrative? Did I? Yeah, so it's something very delicate, but I think it's necessary. And it's necessary also to do it from a local point of view when we are able to be in, when we are able to be heard, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and carrying on from that, I mean, Hoda, a lot of your work looks at, uh, you know, this challenging the kind of dominant narratives in the history of photography and you're you know you, you're interested I think you're all probably really interested in this idea of you know truth in photography and whether photography you know can can document truth um but I wondered if you wanted to pick up from what Miriam said about I'm interested in this idea about control you know the control of images and you know how you how you manage that to ensure that your, the work that you produce is not then being misrepresented, or how how do you create strategies around around the way in which that your work is is understood? Um, or thanks. do you not? Do you yeah. just have to accept that <laughs> that's just? Um, it's you know we can talk about this question of documentary forever, and that's something that has occupied me for as long as I've been practicing and like constantly rethinking this genre because. I think it's a really powerful genre and it's the most immediate way of communicating stories and narratives to, to the audience. But the, the, the irony is that the medium has uh, been picked up by world powers because they understand its power. It's been hijacked. But, and a lot of the problems that we have with race, gender and so many other issues is because of the uh, misuse of documentary and the way that documentary has told us the stories that we were meant to be hearing. So I do acknowledge the power of it and I want to use that power to somehow reverse the dynamic or just um, not undo that, you can't claim it, but in some ways respond to it in your own way. But also like it's important to think about what documentary means because we somehow misunderstood it as truth, but documentary is merely an evidence, a, a piece of evidence, you know, that um, can never be complete in the way that it tells the story. And that's why I think I, I try to embrace those limitations when I make work rather than despair it or hide it, you know. Uh, the work that I try to make is hiding as much as it's revealing. It doesn't intend to tell the fullest story. In fact, it removes more, you know, than it reveals. And I, I do that intentionally because I want people to enter the work from there. Like there's an entry point for the audience, you know, it's not didactic, it's not coming to you with the truth, you know. Um, and the, I don't know, I was just talking to a few friends last night saying that we are all trying to rethink this uh, me medium of photography in our own ways. And I just try to think about every project and collaborate with people, have dialogues, try to think of a different way of telling that story. And in most cases for me, the subjects that I work with um, are people that have been denied the right to beauty and poetry, you know. Often when we talk about uh, violence, we tend to reduce the subject to the violence that they've been subjected to. And... Um, and that's something that is quite numbing. That's why we, off, we have lost the ability to respond to the images of violence, and especially in the context of non-Western subjects. And um, so 
I keep that in mind and maybe the next generation questions the way that I approached it. You know, it may seem a better way of doing it now, but it may not be the case in the future. You know what I'm saying? Miriam, did you want to did you want to say something in response? Uh, yes, but but I don't want to like occupy the space. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to to react to what you were saying about like um, the importance of text in our work. Like we're we're talking about images in particular, but I think that when we are documenting something, it's very important to write to to use the correct wording because. For example, you were talking about this overflow of images that the the viewer's eyes have been um, that have been normalized have normalized and have kind of dehumanized. Um, so we have this overdose of images, but at the same time, if we don't use the correct words to identify these images, they're they're just useless. Like, no one will take them seriously. No one will look at them. No one will identify the real issue. Yeah. First. Yeah, actually, text and image is, um, is a really, there's a, there's a really interesting relationship. And actually, you, you've worked quite a lot with Ukrainian poets and uh, other um, art forms that, you know, no, within I think making your... I mean, for me, for like, for, for example, I collaborated, um, well, not, I mean, I've, I was lucky enough to have Ilya Kaminsky's poetry in the Odessa book. Um, I, when I was finished finishing the the editing process, um, I really, I'm really not a great talker or writer, <laughs> so I really wanted some kind of poetry because to me the the place is so poetic, um, and um, I we I looked at you know poets that lived in Odessa, people old. Uh, uh, poets, Ukrainian poets that spent time in Odessa, and um, I was lucky enough to find Ilya's work, um, who um, who was an immigrant like me, who immigrated when he was 14 to America, and uh, wrote, I found this book online called Dancing in Odessa, um, and just freak that, I mean, he's just a genius. And, he is, I agree, I uh, love him. He's incredible. The Public is my most favorite poetry book. He's incredible. He's incredible. Mind blowing. Mind blowing. So I sent him, I got his contact, I sent him the book and he said, this is, you portrayed my hometown. He's like, you put in images what I put into words and he gave me these poems to use. And I wow. felt so um, lucky. lucky, very lucky. And, um, and I think it's so important to find words that can express what you see as a visual artist, especially if you can find it from another artist and the two of you see the same place through the same eyes. It's such a gift. And um, I think it really added to the book, uh, I think, it, it captured what I would want to say, which I could never say because I am not a poet, <laughs> but it, it was an amazing experience. You are just a slightly different <laughs> a visual version. Yeah. Um, so I've just got one more question and then I think we'll, we'll move to the floor because I could ask you guys questions all day. Um, but Hodder and I have talked quite a lot about this idea about, um, and I, I don't know how you identify, whether you identify as displaced or diasporic or but this role this idea about roles and responsibilities of people that are on the ground and the roles of people that are you know distant either through choice or by force um and how do you feel about um your role however you might identify within that um in terms of supporting what you know what's happening in your na native your native countries um, go. Yes. I'll go. Um, I think for me, it was like extremely important in this, I mean, and, and, and continues to be to, to just talk about Ukraine, to, to talk about, keep it in, in people's minds and in, in, in what's happening there, um, to humanize the, like what you were speaking about, like these images of 
we're so desensitized from the images of war and like just seeing people in some kind of a, a horrible situations. It's just like you have to, like for me, like just the pictures of people where you can connect to them and look in their eyes and feel the humanity in them. That that just you have to. We can't just. It's just like you can't turn away because you're like this is a person that was going for a coffee the night before and the next day their whole country is being blown to pieces. I mean, how do we not emphasize? How do we not have empathy? How do we not have compassion? How do we not? This could happen to all of us and it is happening. I mean, it's just happening everywhere. How can we not talk about what's happening in Gaza? How can we not? We can't, and it's just so um, important for us to, if we're not there on the ground documenting, it's important for us to talk about it and put it, put it in people's faces so they don't close their eyes and pretend that it's not happening. I think it's super important. Um, yeah, I agree with you. And also there's this sort of like um, acknowledgement of like, we are not living there. That's one question. So that also gives us some sort of a privilege, but I think that privilege could be used um, in, in a productive way um, because those of us who are from those places, we have a very different way of telling the story of our people than the stories that are reported by the outside as gays. So um, the, acknowledging the privilege, but also like being able to use that platform and privilege towards, you know, helping your people. But it also comes at a cost. For example, for myself, the cost is that I may never be able to go back to my home country after speaking about it. But that was a question I had to ask myself at that point. That and, am and I your whole family's to, there. Right? My whole family yeah. lives there. And whether I should be thinking about myself at this point or when the young people are losing their lives for this cause, um, that's the last thing you want to, you know, think about. So uh, these decisions are quite tough to make at, uh, at certain points and you, you make choices along the way, but it's the sense of responsibility and urgency that um, you can't live with, that, with yourself you know, if, if, you, if you don't do that either, yeah. Um, I want to say something connected to what you both just said. Uh, from one side, I think, that, I think that it's obvious that photography, history, and practice is colonial in some way. And so in this sense, it's important to amplify the voices of people in like living, actually living what's happening. But uh, from another side, I think that as you were saying right now, like it's very important to use our privilege. Like we're not under the bombs. It's important to, to talk. And not only if we're from the region, but also like, like we're all human beings. It's important to use our voice to speak up, even if it's not happening to us or the person next to us. Yeah. Thank you. Um, does anybody have any questions? Oof. Oh, we covered everything. Yeah, we, we covered everything. Hi. How important for you is the approval of the subjects you're photographing in your work? Can you repeat that again? I didn't hear it. As I was uh, like, I mean, you mentioned uh, about Ukraine, how you kind of, people from Ukraine said, to, from Odessa said, oh, you must publish it now. But before that, you were not into publishing it, you were wanting to kind of keep it. So in, in, a, in, a, in a broader question is how important is the approval of your subjects that you're photographing for you to be able to continue your work, whether it's to publish or to continue doing it? Um, for me, it's very important. Like for me, it's a, uh, it's um, photo photography for me when I photograph a person, it's a 50, 50. It's like, I will never be able to take a good picture of somebody if they don't want to share something with me. Those pictures become mediocre. They're, um, they're not very interesting. I feel like, um, 
that's for me, obviously, it's, it's different for everybody. But for me, the best pictures I take is when somebody wants to share something with me and they're open. And it will, it will sometimes happen completely organically where I don't even approach somebody. They can look at me from across. They know I'm, I'm picking up a camera. And if I have an eye contact and they will almost like a wink and they're like, all right, you can do this. And then I feel like I'm taking a picture that is not invasive. I, I don't feel like I'm taking something away from them. I feel like we're having a conversation. Um, so it's very important for me, personally. Uh, the same. I started off as a social documentary photography in Iran. And I, I felt more and more uncomfortable with the idea of click and run and just making a picture of someone and not knowing who they are just and take the picture and never see them again, but continue using that picture. Um, that's why most of my, I, 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 my strategy of making work has changed. I make only with people, work with people that I have developed a relationship over the time. Over time, they know what is going to happen to the picture if they stand in front of my camera, meaning that it's going to be shared, published. And um, it always comes from, you know, the dialogue between us time and um yeah a form of collaboration so the, the consent is you know um there when they stand in front of the camera or sometimes it's an invitation from them for for me to tell this story you know to document the story so yeah i that's why i changed that methodology to be to felt to feel more comfortable with that um same here from my side too um and I think that recently, in these past three years, I've been realizing that as much as images are, can be so power, powerful, at the same time, they can put us in danger. And they can, like the same images that we take to take space and to, exist, to simply exist, can be used against us as a proof of whatever we were doing. That, for example, uh, the picture of the cover of the book is two women kissing. And it can put them in danger. So the collaboration in this work is so important for me. Yeah. But it took me a lot of time to realize this because again, like photography is patriarchal, colonial. It is like, yeah. <laughs> I want to say something like give you an example about that. Like I was invited by a group of gay men in Iran to photograph them in a secret bathhouse. We all knew what that means, you know, the dangers involved in it and the risk taking um element you know um you know being a homosexual in iran is something that is you know not acceptable and also in some cases can put your life in danger and but that was like the risk taking decision that was you know made by all of us the myself and the people who wanted to be in the photograph so if anything happens we all made that decision consciously together, if you know what I mean, because it's more of a political act that we are alive, we are here, we exist, even if you want to deny our existence. And for that, like the women on the streets, like all of those examples that I was showing you, it's like the political act of like, um, th that's the definition of politics in general, you know, that the struggle for recognition, we all as human beings want to be recognized. And once when it's you know uh, taken away from us, it takes courage to make that a statement. And so, when it comes as a kind of a collaboration, um, you know, you take that risk together as well. Um, I think we might be out of time. Um, well, may, oh, I, maybe we have one time for one more question. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Is this yes? Thank you. That was very interesting, and thank you, Fiona. Um, I have a, a question. I think it's for Hoda more than anyone else, perhaps, in relation to one area of conflict might be between the protagonist you're photographing and the audience. In as much as the audience are not there, your job as a documentary photographer, I guess, is to kind of bring us there. But the conflict I feel is that very often um, I've taken photographs of thousands of demonstrations over the years. They all look the same, and they don't really tell us very much. I'm a bit worried about how uniform some of the images are that come out of conflicts, and particularly in demonstrations. 
that those people who are putting their lives on the line, those people who are protagonists in the conflict, uh, somehow it doesn't really come through into the photography that results, that we finish up with lots of cliches sometimes. So it, it, sometimes it can almost alienate an audience, a potential audience, if all the images are the same. Um, and just quickly, I saw a film in, yesterday, um, it was called The Old Oak, uh, Ken Loach film, um, but what he did with protagonists in terms of the conflict there, a very small conflict, but he brought the pictures back to the protagonists in a, in a, in a community environment, so that those people who are doing the work for us effectively are included in the photographs and can see it and become collective again in the, the showing of the photographs. So that's a bit of a hurdle for me, actually, how you include an audience in the conflict you're photographing. Um, just uh, because I, I, I think I hear, I'm not sure if I heard your question correctly. You're asking how do you leave in a space for the audience to enter, uh, to read the images? How do I include my audience? Um, I think I was talking about it in the previous, um, like responded to it in the previous question. Uh, I try to make work that is quite ambiguous as a kind of a reaction to documentaries didact didactism, uh, which is often like the photographer tells us what's exactly happening and we consume it as truth and reality, which again in itself is like the frame of the camera is quite limiting how much you can include. Often like there's a lot of the story around it that is left out, you know? And so I want to acknowledge that in some ways and... Um, for me, um, the truth is always subjective, and by making images that are giving us a glimpse of the matter, like a reference to it, but also leaving the space open for reading is the way to talk about issue or the highlighting the issue rather than claiming that I'm going to tell you exactly what to think and how to think about it. You know, I'd rather make work that um, creates more question marks than answering um, your questions because for me the most important thing if I can do is to trigger the question make you stop and pause and wanting to know what's going on and ask questions and the rest is your responsibility as the audience how to how to read it and how to connect with it that's that's my thinking about it but it may work for someone and might may not for others thank you very much uh, thank you for joining us. Um, please go away and digest and investigate and interrogate and have a look at these wonderful photographers because our responsibility uh, as we sit here responding to the work that these brave women are making is to engage and educate ourselves. So thank you for thank your work. You. Thank you for participating. Thank you so much. Thank you.